So thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. This is my first tree net. Um, and uh, I'm not talking at all today about anything, in, in a sense, trying to keep the trees healthy and alive. The thing I'm trying to do is uh, in integrate decay into the trees that you're trying to keep. So there's over 350 species of wildlife in Australia that rely on tree hollows for their survival, whether that's nesting, denning, uh, raising young. So 350 different species at least. Natural, naturally, hollows occur in trees uh, they're at least about 100, maybe 150 years old. Um, what happens, the tree is damaged in some way, then decay forms, the hollow forms, and the animals use it. In pre-European um, conditions, woodlands would have had somewhere between 20 and 30 large or hollow-bearing trees per hectare. Um, so if you're a hollow-dependent species, it was good to be around 200 years ago, less so now, because most of the, many of the species that in Australia that are declining are reliant on tree hollows. Um, and across the globe, there's an understanding that large trees are disappearing across many landscapes around the world. So what we've done to try and mitigate some of that is we've been installing nest boxes. Nest boxes come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. This is just a standard square timber box. Other boxes are um, plastic, recycled plastic materials. Um, other boxes are printed, 3D printed. And there must be, and I'm making up a number here, there must be thousands of different shapes and sizes and designs around. And we've been deploying them in Australia since the 1970s at least. And there's lots and lots of evidence to show lots and lots of different species use nest boxes. And so we've been continuing to put them out there as a solution to this problem. But recent research has shown that nest boxes are in fact far, many nest boxes are far not superior, the other word, inferior to natural hollows um, in terms of their cost effectiveness, thermal capacity, uh, suitability for different species of wildlife. An alternative, which we've started to do a bit more of recently, are natural log hollows. So this is where we, usually happens when a tree is removed for a development, we try and salvage the log and we might just put a cap on each end, maybe drill it out a little bit further, and then we try and hoist this bloody heavy thing back up into the tree and hope it doesn't fall on anyone. They're heavy, they're difficult to inspect, still limited research out there on how useful and effective they are. Recently though, in the last few years, we've started going a bit bananas, I think, on carved or chainsaw hollows. And this is where you just basically cut a hole in the tree. It might be with a chainsaw, it could be with some other drill technique. Um, you might make a hollow and, and make it suitable for occupation straight away, or maybe it's just carving an entrance and let nature take its course. But we've still got I think quite a bit of uncertainty around what the best technique for installing these carved or chainsaw hollows, what are the impacts on tree health, how long do these things survive in the tree, do wildlife prefer them over natural hollows, and because there's a lot of labour involved in installing these, they can be quite expensive. So the problem as I see it is that we've been putting nest boxes in for 40 years, um, just this recently, uh, this, this year, I've been involved in a project, a major infrastructure project, where the state government um, has said you're not allowed to use nest boxes as a replacement for the 300 odd large trees with hollows that you're removing. They said um, that you must use either carved or chainsaw hollows and or salvaged log hollows. Nest boxes will not satisfy the condition of approval for this project to go ahead. But as I said before, there's a lot of uncertainty still. And this, is, it's, and this government department saying this is what you have to do, but we're not sure whether they, you know, how well they still work. Um, and so there's a lot of questions, I think, still out there about the impacts of carved hollows in terms of design, size, installation technique, impacts on tree health, and preferences for different species of wildlife. So rather than seeing this as a problem, I like to see this as an opportunity. I'm a half glass full kind of person. So the opportunity here, and I guess the question, the challenge, is do we have to wait another 40 years from now 
before we have enough certainty for a state or a federal government regulator to say, yes, you can use carved and chainsaw hollows, or no, carved chainsaw hollows are not suitable replacements for natural tree hollows. Because that's what happened with nest boxes. We started putting them out in the 70s, almost 50 years ago. And it's only this year where a state government has said no more nest boxes on a particular project. And I think it's in everyone's interest, ours, but also wildlife and the trees, that we figure out as quickly as possible whether carved and chainsaw hollows um, are effective and what the, um, what the outcomes are. Because if we're doing it for 40 years, you know, and we're deploying hundreds of these maybe a year, that's a lot of money. And the ecological outcomes, if they aren't as good as we think they are, won't um, satisfy and won't be of any benefit to wildlife. So my proposal is that we should be um, taking the, the mantra, if you like, that every installation of carved or chainsaw hollows should be seen as an opportunity to maximise learning while doing. And there's two, at least two different ways that this might happen. One is that each installation is a standalone experiment, and I'll go into some detail about these in a moment, or that each installation is part of a bigger opportunity, uh, a bigger project rather. And in fact, in that sense, each hollow that you might install forms part of a larger data set. So if we agree that not only should we be putting hollows into trees, and of course there's places where we should be doing this and places where we shouldn't, so I would suggest that maybe in a park where people are doing whatever it is that people do in parks under trees, um, we should, probably shouldn't be installing hollows in those trees, but maybe there are others where it's safer. And I think Grant Harris will be talking tomorrow about some of those risk considerations. But if we agree that we should be learning while doing, um, the first, uh, I guess, way is what I've called opportunistic or small scale installations. This is where a council might maybe put in five or 10 chainsaw hollows a year as a tree dies or an opportunity arises, that's when you install it. But it's pretty random, it's when opportunity comes up. The other one might be a, ma a major infrastructure project where they're removing 300 trees and the instruction from the regulator is install chainsaw hollows or, cut or log hollows. And that's an opportunity, you could actually set up an experiment where you install let's say 100 log hollows, salvage log hollows, 100 carved hollows and 100 um, something else and you compare the use of those different types. If you're doing opportunistic things, you guess you, there's two different ways. One is you just put in whatever you think is a good thing and hope for the best and maybe someone someday will come along and do some measurements and evaluate it. That's not what I'm recommending. This is, this is what I'm recommending, there we go, to collaborate with other land managers who are also installing small numbers of hollows at a time. So this might be neighbouring councils. If everyone puts in 10 hollows a year and there's 10 neighbouring councils working together, all of a sudden you've got 100 hollows a year and you could, if you work together, design that in such a way that um, it becomes an experiment. Or as I said, if you're doing in a major project, installing 300 hollows, do it in an experimental way. So I think there's five steps to an experiment. First of all is um, find a crazy scientist, but um, ask the right questions and articulate those questions really well, because the rest of what you do depends on the question and how you frame it. Then it's about designing the best study you can do uh, to answer those questions that you are asking or the hypothesis that you might have posed. And I will go through these in a bit more detail. Run the experiment, collect the data, analyse it, report it, and then if you have to, modify um, your, your management practices. In terms of asking the questions, the first thing I'd say is don't talk to dodgy brothers or dodgy sisters tree loppers, because they're the people who are just cutting down the trees. They may say to you that they know what they're doing, but be careful. And in fact, that goes for every, everyone that you might talk to. There's dodgy ecologists as well out there, so I'm not excluding myself from that. But find people who are really good in their field. 
who know the field, who know the research that's going on, who are well connected, um, whether they're arborists, researchers or consultants, and get really good advice. The question might relate specifically to your problem or situation. For example, if you've got an endangered species in your area and you're tasked with improving the number of that species in the landscape, the question might be, does endangered species X prefer a particular type of hollow? Or it might be more generally applicable. So for example, are chainsaw hollows a cost-effective long-term solution to a reduction in the number of tree hollows in a particular area? Try and avoid vague questions. So, you know, the chainsaws, the chainsaw hollows work. I mean, what, the chainsaw, how many, if I've heard that question, if I get a dollar for every time I've heard that question, I'd be quite rich, I think. I mean, what does it actually mean, do chainsaw hollows work? So try and think about the question and articulate it in a way that's answerable. Um, avoid questions with yes, no answers because the question might be, can chainsaw hollows kill trees? And the answer is, uh, yep, maybe, depends. But of course, if you make a chainsaw hollow big enough, you're gonna kill the tree. Um, so think about how that question is phrased. So a better question might be, what's the effect of chainsaw hollows on tree health? And then over time, and there's different ways to design it, but looking at changes in the, survive, the health and survival of the limb and the tree, What's the effect of the size of the hollow? So maybe some hollows are built big and some are built small. And how does that uh, relate to the size of the limb in which the hollow is installed? What's the effect of tree species? Some tree species might be able to handle certain sizes or types of hollows, other species not. And so going back to this idea of an experiment, what actually is an experiment? Well, it's a, a scientific approach or method where we test a hypothesis or ask questions while holding confounding variables constant. And by confounding variables, I mean all the stuff that muddies up your ability to answer that question. So if, for example, your question is, what's the, what size entrance hole does a possum prefer? Well, you could install identical boxes on the same aspect of the tree at the same height, in the same forest type, etc., etc. So the only thing that varies is the size of the entrance hole. If you start having different types of hollows and different types of entrance holes, then it becomes much harder to tease out the effect of the size of the entrance hole, which is the question, in this case, that you're most interested in. And if you put up a whole bunch of boxes or chainsaw hollows around the place and try and come back in 10 years and answer that question, you might get lucky, it might work, but it's unlikely. So it's really important to try and hold those confounding variables constant and answer that specific question that you're interested in. There's many different ways to design a study and we could probably spend an afternoon at least talking about study design, but the best approach that gives you the most power to answer that question is a replicated Bucky design. And Bucky stands for before, after, control, impact. So take measurements before and after the hollows are installed. Measure things at control sites, for example, places without hollows, and measurements at impact sites. So that might be the places where you install the hollows. There are lots of other designs. Some of them you take measurements just before and after. Some of them you don't um, take measurements before and it's just after, but it's much more difficult with these other designs to detect an effect of the thing that you're interested in. So the idea, the goal is to get as much reliable data as you possibly can. But having said all that, there's no one size that fits all. The optimal study design depends on your question, how much time and money you've got, expertise available, etc., etc. So if the question was, does species X prefer a certain type of hollow? Well, you could put up five different hollows on the tree. And that's good because that way you can determine which one of those five different boxes they use. But ideally, you would replicate it. And you might have 20 or 30 or 100 of these different sampling units. And that way, you're, you're minimising the impact of location on your answers. And you get much more reliable data. So let's say the question is, what's the effect of ambient climate on the internal microclimate of your hollow. So 
There's been lots of chainsaw hollows already installed. Maybe there's 100 we can find in Queensland. There's some in the mountain ash forest for leadbeater's possum. It's cold and wet there. Adelaide, it's beautiful and sunny today. Maybe not tomorrow. Um, and there's been a bunch of hollows for swift parrots in Tassie. So you could go there, measure the internal climate of each of these different locations. But, and it's a good sample size, 100 of each, that's pretty good. But the problem is that in each of those four locations, I'm guessing here, but let's say the, the hollows in Queensland are of one particular type, the hollows for leadbeater's possum are another, etc. So the difference here is that any difference may not be due to climate, but it could be due to the different type of hollow. So then you can't answer that question that you're asking. So the solution might be install identical hollows in each of these four locations, or maybe install multiple different types of hollows in each location. There's probably many other ways you could tackle this question, and I don't have time to go into it today, but um, just to give you a bit of a flavour. I guess one of the final points is that collaboration, we won't do this on our own. We have to collaborate with each other. So if, particularly if you're uh, doing opportunistic or small scale installations, you need to work with other local land managers who want to do the same thing. Pull your resources and you'll save money, but also answer some of these questions more quickly. Arborists, you need to collaborate with other arborists. If, you know, you might suggest that your technique is the best, I would question that because we haven't done the research to find out. You also need to talk to researchers, ecologists and land managers. Land managers, you also need to talk to people. And irrespective of whether you're doing small scale, opportunistic or large scale studies, every hollow you install should be recorded in your asset database. Greg said this morning that every tree should be in your database, every hollow should be in there as well. Particular, well at least every carved hollow, chainsaw hollow, nest, nest box that you're installing should be in there. So in conclusion, um, that last point, every hollow that you install should be part of your asset register and database. Treat every installation as if it's part of an experiment and design it so it is part of an experiment. Think about those questions. So there are questions at an academic sort of research, wildlife sort of level, but there's also important questions as land managers. If you're going to install hollows, make sure your trees don't fall over and, you know, damage people and property. So there's some of the questions that you might be asking. Aim for the best scientific study design you can and you need to collaborate with others. And finally, I guess the point is that experiments and this rigorous evaluation is the only way to fast track the building of a reliable evidence-based and best practice system for replacement of hollows for wildlife. <coughs>